several theories about what Paul could have been um, experiencing. And one is that he may have had some sort of eye trouble. It could have been some, some kind of uh, psychological distress that he was experiencing at that time. Um, it could have been just because of opposition that he was getting from uh, false prophets and preachers. We don't know what the particular thorn was. And uh, the, the only thing that Paul really says to describe it is he calls it the messenger of Satan to buffet him. To buffet means to beat down. To buffet means to rip apart, to tear apart, to tear down. And this thorn, however, was a gift from God. This wasn't a gift from the devil. This wasn't a gift from Satan. This was a gift from God. God allowed Paul to have this thorn. And God, in the same way, allows thorns in our lives to keep us grounded and humble before him. There's a purpose for the thorn. There, he has a will attached to the thorn that he has assigned to us. So when I talk about thorny gifts, I'm not talking about something that comes from the devil. I'm not talking about that, something that comes from Satan. I'm talking about something that comes directly from God. But it's working a far greater purpose within you. Um, a thorn is a, a great source of pain or irritation. It could be an affliction. It could be a sickness. It could be... Uh, just a, a nuisance, a hindrance. Um, it could be a personal relationship that you have. It could be a person that you're dealing with. A person in your life could be your thorn. It could be psychological. It could be physical, emotional, spiritual. All of us have thorns in our lives. All of us have something that uh, causes us to uh, uh, realize that we're nothing without God. It causes us to lay before God and to pray. Um, it causes us to realize that we really need to lean on God because with this thorn, I need God's help. I need his assistance. I can't make it without God. I'm totally and completely trusting and depending on God to see me through whatever this thorn is. All of us have thorns, whether you're saved or whether you're unsaved. We've all got thorns in our lives that we have to deal with. And although thorns are considered a nuisance in nature, they do serve the purpose of protecting and defending the flower against harmful insects or animals who desire to consume of the petals of that flower. Um, thorns usually are, uh, they're, they're really spiky, they're really sharp tips on the stem of a flower and they usually point downward so that as the insect is attempting to climb up the flower um, it's encountered with the uh the thorns okay and i'll go a little bit elaborate a little bit uh, more on that later on in the lesson tonight and like he did paul sometimes god will not remove the thorn but he gives us the necessary grace to endure the sting of that thorn now, uh, when we often talk about grace in church, it's often um, talked about in a positive sense. Uh, we talk about uh, favor. We talk about the uh, unmerited favor of God when we refer to grace. We talk about salvation when we refer to grace. We talk about the blood of Jesus when we refer to grace. And although all of those things do pertain to grace, there are several definitions of grace. Um, when God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, grace serves the context of, of being defined as the supernatural ability to endure great pain and suffering. That's the context that that word grace serves in that particular scripture. He's talking about, I've given you enough power. I've given you enough sustaining power to endure with this thorn. I'm not going to take it away from you. I'm not going to remove it from you. If I remove it, yes, it'll take away the pain. But I'm going to, with the thorn, give you the amount of grace necessary to handle it. And all of us have a certain spiritual pain index that we can handle. That's why I don't go through what you go through. And you don't, and you can't go through what I go through because you can't carry the weight. I've been designed, I've been created to carry a certain level of weight. 
not just a weight of glory, but a weight of pain, a weight of burden, a weight of sorrow that would kill somebody else, but I have been designed to carry it. It would make somebody else go crazy. It would cause somebody else to have a nervous breakdown, but God has a strategically designed me to be able to handle. He's graced me to be able to handle the issues that I'm going through, to be able to handle the problems that I'm dealing with, to be able to handle the thorns that I've been assigned. That's why you can go through what you go through and I can go through what I go through. We all have different levels of grace. Amen. And so, yes, he says to Paul, I have given you the necessary grace to bear it to endure it. I'm not removing it. I'm not taking it away. I've heard your prayer. I know you came to me thrice about it. You came to me three times, but I'm not doing anything about it. I'll just give you the grace to handle it. I'll give you the grace to go through. First Corinthians 10 and 13 says this, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able all right, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. Catch that phrase. He will with the temptation. He doesn't say anything about removing the temptation. He doesn't say anything about taking the temptation away or easing the temptation, but he says with the temptation, he will also make a way of escape. And sometimes that way of escape is his grace. Sometimes that way of escape is his enabling power. It's his supernatural divine power within you to endure it and to bear it, all right? Notice that the Bible does not say that, that God will remove the temptation. He's not removing it, but he's working for your good. That thing, that thorn that you're having to deal with, it's all working for your good. It's all turning around for your good, all right? We, all, we, we know the Bible says that for all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. God, we already have established that God loves you, but you also have to know that you are called of God. And if you are called of God, whatever you're going through is going to work toward his purpose for your life. All right. I also went over the five functions of your particular thorn. Here was function number one. The thorn that you have is to humble you, is to cause you to have humility, for you to realize that you are totally dependent and, and you have to rely on God, all right? Your thorn helps you to maintain the right perspective. You are nothing without God. You were gifted with this thorn so that you have a reason to stay on your knees in prayer, so that you'd have a reason to seek his face, a reason to fast, a reason to search the scriptures. If we didn't have any thorns, if we didn't have any issues, we didn't have any problems, we probably wouldn't pray as much. We probably wouldn't seek his face as much. We probably wouldn't call out to him as much. We probably wouldn't even rely on him as much if we didn't have this thorn. And so that's what the thorn does. It causes you to remain humble. Um, and I talked about the story of Jacob wrestling in the wilderness. Um, the Bible calls him a man, but we, we know him as the angel of the Lord, which is some sort of theophany, some sort of physical manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, he had, Christ hadn't been born yet, okay? But he did often make appearances in the Old Testament. And when you uh, see passages referring to the angel of the Lord, that's who we're talking about, all right? And so he wrestles with this man in the wilderness. And the Bible says that he was, he was prevailing against him. And when the angel of the Lord saw that he was prevailing against him, he smote him in his hip, all right? Which caused Jacob to limp, caused him to limp. So he was deformed. Um, he had a disabled, uh, he was disabled for the rest of his life moving forward. All right. Now he was greatly blessed, but he had to live with that limp. All right. And that limp is symbolic of Jacob's total dependence on God. Yes, he was greatly blessed. Yes, God was going to increase him. Yes, God was going to use him and his family. And today the Israelites are still living, still thriving, and still being blessed and watched over and protected by God. But he had to live with that limp. 
That limp was a reminder to him that he had to lean on God. See, your thorn, your limp, that thing that, that, that's on, on the side of you, that, that's irritating you, that's causing irritation, that's causing you to cry at night, it's, it's reminding you that you need to completely lean on God, that you cannot lean to your own understanding, that you cannot rely on your own ability, that you cannot rely on your own finances, on your own doing. You have to rely completely and totally on the Lord. So that was function number one of your thorn. Function number two, this thorn that you have is to strengthen you. This thorn is causing you to rely on his strength and not on yours. God's strength is made complete in your weakness. That's what the scripture means when he tells Paul, for when I am, when, when Paul says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. That seems like an oxymoron, right? You're talking about when I'm weak, then I'm strong. But what he's saying right there is in my weakness, God's strength is made complete. Okay. God can't, not, cannot uh, utilize his strength through you if you're relying on your own strength. All right. But in your weak state, the reason why you look strong is because you're relying on God's strength. Yeah. That's the reason why you look put together. That's the reason why people look at you and can't even believe you've gone through the things that you've gone through because you don't look like what you've been through. You don't look like what you've struggled with. And it's not because you're so good or you're so put together. It's because the Holy Ghost is pulling you together. But without the Holy Ghost, without God pulling you together, you'd be a hot mess. All right. So the only reason why you look strong is because you've been graced. You've been graced by God. Here is uh, function number three. This thorn is bringing you to spiritual perfection. Now that word perfection I talked about a couple of weeks ago, it doesn't serve the same context that we talk about perfection today. Now when we refer, refer to per perfection today, we're thinking uh, uh, never making a mistake. All right, always just perfect, just doing it right all the time. But that's not the biblical definition of perfection. The biblical definition, definition of perfection is referring to spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity. Now, as long as you're living in this earth and as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to say something wrong. You're going to do something wrong, even if it, if, if it was unintentional. OK, you're always going to as long as you're in this flesh, you're always going to make mistakes. But we have to get to a point where we live spiritually mature lives. And I talked about what a mature spiritual life looks like. What it looks like is not living meticulously in sin. Okay. Uh, what it looks like is forgiving others, not being so, so easily offended by things and offended by people. Okay. Maturity, spiritual maturity looks like consistency. You're not constantly up and down. I'm not really talking about emotions. I'm talking about your commitment, consistency in your commitment to God. You know, we have people out there who claim to be saved, claim to have a relationship with God, claim to know him, but they're constantly up and down. They're here, they're there, they're over here. They didn't join this church. They're not going to church no more. Now they're back at church. Now they, they're not really sure, you know, if they want to go back to church. They're just all over the place, here and there and everywhere. They're a Christian this week. They're a Muslim the next week. They're, uh, they're somewhere in between the, the following week. That's not spiritual maturity. God is trying to get us all to a point where we can be conformed into the image of his son and reach a level where we are spiritually mature in him. All right. First Corinthians uh, 15 and 58 says this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All right, here is function number four of your thorn. This thorn releases the power and the glory of God within you. That's what this thorn is doing. It's releasing God's power through you. We often talk about in church, anointing fall on me we need your glory we want to see your glory we want to you know see miracle signs and wonders and we want to do wonders and all of this other stuff well okay if you want the glory of god if you want the power of god it comes with thorns okay 
That's what it comes with. It comes with thorns. If you want to operate in the anointing of God, if you want to lay hands on the sick, if you want to raise the dead, if you want to perform these miracles, you have to have thorns. Can't get away from it. All right. That's the only way that the power and the glory of God can be revealed in you. The Bible says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That was Romans 8 and 18. So sufferings, sufferings are, are, are uh, uh, um, connected to the glory. So you can't have the glory over your life without going through some kind of suffering. All right. I like what uh, Sister uh, Whitney is saying here. She's saying it comes with crushing. Yes, it comes with crushing. Now, we all know that in, in order for an, an olive to produce oil, it has to be crushed. All right? We all know that. And in order for the oil of God, in order for the oil of God to flow through you and to flow in your life, there are certain areas of your life in which you have to be crushed. It's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes it's inconvenient. It doesn't feel good, but it's necessary in order for the oil to be produced. Amen. And here is the um, the fifth function of your thorn that I went over two weeks ago. Your thorn is to help somebody else. Your thorn gives you the ability to be a blessing to somebody else. All right. Sometimes your thorns um, have nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. It, 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 it's not about um, the, the your past previous sins. It's not about a mistake that you made. It has, it has nothing to do with you, but it has everything to do with somebody else. Now, sometimes your thorns, yeah, sometimes they do have something to do with you. They do have something to do with you. Um, I was looking, uh, doing a study of the word thorn in the Bible and came across several passages where they referenced thorn. And in many of those passage, passages, Thorns were, um, um, when, when the Bible references thorns, it's talking about the enemies of Israel, all right, and how a lot of times the, the uh, enemies of Israel uh, made pacts or, or relationship covenants with, with the Israelites, and God was telling them, um, if you don't break these uh, covenants off with these enemies, if you don't break off these relationships, all right, if you don't drive out the inhabitants, the evil inhabitants out of this land, then I'm going to cause your enemies to be a thorn to you. All right. So sometimes our thorns are a result of some covenant relationships that we've made that we shouldn't have been making. Some relationships God told us to get out of. God told us, don't do that. Don't call them. Don't don't uh, uh, negotiate with them. Don't sign that contract. And we did it anyway. And now they're a thorn to us. All right. So some thorns come as a result of this, of the decisions and the choices that we make in our lives. But sometimes God assigns a thorn to you and it has nothing to do with anything that you've done wrong. All right. But it's to help somebody else, because when you get the victory over this thorn, you're going to win a victory vicariously for somebody else. Because somebody else may be headed in the in the in the direct in a wrong direction, but because you've endured the thorn and told your testimony, they were able to get deliverance. They were able to come out. They were able to not go that way, not go that uh, a direction, because you won the victory vicariously. There are some things that we're going through right now. We're winning vicariously. We're going to win the victory vicariously for our children. There are some things right now. Uh, that, that even I'm dealing with and going through uh, in my flesh, that when I get the victory over it, it's going to be a blessing for generations to come. It's going to be a blessing to my children. It's going to be a blessing to my unborn grandchildren and my uh, unborn great-grandchildren. When you get the victory over some stuff, that means the generations after you won't have to deal with it. My God. All right. So let me go ahead and move on here, all right? Because we, I'm, I'm running out of time, um, and I'm trying not to do a part three. <laughs> so um, here are three additional functions of your thorn. Three additional functions of your thorn. Uh, is it three or is it four? Four additional functions. I'm sorry, got to had to look back over my notes. Four additional functions of your thorn. Thorn. I already went through five of them. All right. Here's another function of your thorn. Your thorn is to protect you. 
I told you earlier about um, flowers and how they have, you know, these thorns on their stems as a way to protect the petals from uh, being uh, consumed, all right, from being eaten up by insects and animals. And they often point downward, all right, because as you're climbing up, the insects are encountering the thorns because they're being pointed downward toward them, all right? In plant morphology, thorn spines and prickles, and in general, spinal structures are hard, rigid extensions or modifications of leaves, roots, stems, or buds with sharp, stiff ends, all right? But they serve the same function, physically deterring animals from eating the plant material, all right? Paul said that the messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him, beat him down, to tear him down, to uh, uh, strike him repeatedly and violently, to batter him. All right. The enemy is trying to beat you down as well. He's trying to rip you apart. OK, he desires to have you. I recall Jesus told Peter, Satan desired to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for thee. To sift means to examine something thoroughly so as to isolate that which is most important or useful. The enemy has been examining you. He's been observing you. He's been watching you. And he intends to use your thorn to get access, to gain access to your anointing, to gain access to your ministry, to gain access to your calling, and to penetrate you so that he can snatch your purpose. All right? Does that make sense? So it's not, it's not about the enemy just trying to beat you. He's trying to get access to something within you. He's trying to, 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 to get through to you so that he can snatch what God has given you, so that he can snatch the anointing, so that he can snatch the gift, so that he can snatch the ministry out of you. That's what he really wants. That's what he really wants. But what the enemy is using to work against you is actually working for you because your thorn is your defense mechanism. My God. And the thorn that the enemy is trying to use is going to backfire on him. Because while it may be a nuisance, it's producing a level of power and glory within you that will destroy the enemy's kingdom. So the enemy is trying to use your thorn to beat you down. But your thorn is going to produce uh, uh, enough power and glory within you to beat him down and to tear his kingdom down. It's going to backfire on him. His plan is going to backfire on him. All right. I'm hoping this is making sense to everybody. Your thorn, it protects you. All right. It protects you. It doesn't feel good. It's not comfortable having a thorn, but it protects you. It protects your anointing. It protects your gifting. It protects the power that God has given you. It protects your integrity. And it causes you not to become a haughty and arrogant. The Bible says in Proverbs 16 and 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. All right. So what this thorn is doing is, is it's not only uh, 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 protecting you, it's keeping you from, from falling into pride it's keeping you from falling into haughtiness and arrogance all right psalms 27 and 2 says this when the wicked even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh they stumbled and fell lord have mercy when they came upon me to eat up my flesh they stumbled and fell why because there were some thorns that they couldn't get past. They were trying to consume me. They were trying to overtake me. The enemy wants to completely consume you, to eat you up because he knows, he knows the level of power and glory that is within you. And he knows that you are a threat to his kingdom and that what God has given you and what God has anointed you with is going to destroy his plans. It's going to destroy the snares and the traps that he has set, all right? But the Bible says they stumbled and fell. So your thorn is to protect you. Here's another one. Your thorn is refining and purifying your motives and intentions. Let me say that again. Your thorn is refining and purifying your motives and your intentions. The Bible declares uh, Job 
was a blameless and upright man who feared God and shunned evil. He lived a life of holiness before the Lord. But Job had to deal with some thorns himself. He had to deal with a lot of thorns in his life. Uh, we recall the story of, of Job and, and, and how um, Satan had appeared before the sons of God and God spotted him and said, you know, what are you, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm looking for some, seeking for somebody to devour. I'm seeking for somebody to, 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 to get at. And he recommends Job. Have you considered my servant Job? You know, it's amazing for God to recommend you. It's amazing that God has enough trust in you for you to go through what you're going through. Now, we often talk about us trusting in God. But do you not know that God trusts you? God trusts you. Because if he didn't trust you, he wouldn't have given you the particular thorn he's given you. He trusts you to endure. He trusts you to remain in the faith. He trusts you to keep praising him despite your trials and tribulations. And so God trusted Job and recommended him to Satan. All right. Uh, and, 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 the, and we understand that Job lost his children, lost all of his livestock. All right. Lost his servants. He was stricken with boils. It was just one thing after another, after another, after another. Have you ever just in life experienced trials in that way where it's just one thing after another? You can't catch a break. You can't get a breather. You, it's just one thing after another. You get over this and then something else happens. You get the victory over this sickness and then you, now you got a family problem. Well, your family's resolved and now you got problems in your school. Now you got problems in your church. It's just one thing after another. The Bible says that Job was approached one after another, as one messenger was coming to deliver him bad news, there was another messenger coming, and then there was another messenger coming to deliver bad news. My God. But Job writes, uh, uh, He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I shall come forth as gold. Gold is often refined, it's often purified through fire. During the refining process, gold is reliquified in a furnace and then it's heaped with um, a generous amount of soda ash and borax. Um, strong acids, nitric and uh, hydrochloric acid are used to dissolve the impurities in the gold, all right? And then afterwards, they're neutralized and washed away, taking the impurities with them, all right? And this effectively separates the gold from impurities or other metal traces in the gold, all right? In the same way, God is using your thorn to clean you out. He's using your thorn to take out the impurities, to take away what's not pleasing to him so that your anointing is not contaminated. Now you have some people out there that are anointed, but it's it's contaminated with some other stuff. There's some other stuff going on. Yes, you're anointed. Yes, you have the oil of God, but you've got some other stuff on the inside of you that causes your particular anointing to become contaminated. This purification process ensures that you operate in your anointing and in your ministry with integrity, authenticity, and character. Integrity, authenticity, and character. You need you need that fire. You need that fire in order to in order to uh, uh, live a life that is um, authentic before God. You need that fire to burn up everything on the inside of you that's not like God, that's not pleasing to God. All right. God is using your thorn to test where you really are in him to discover what your true motivations and intentions are. All right. Although the Bible describes Job as perfect and upright, that does not mean that Job didn't have his issues. He had some issues, all right? Yes, he was blameless. Yes, he was perfect. Yes, he was upright. Yes, he lived a life of holiness, but he had some stuff going on within him too, all right? He, he, he questioned God, you know, and, and started talking about, you know, well, you know, did I do something wrong? You know, did, did I harm somebody? Why has this come upon me? What did I do to deserve this? All right. He struggled with his pride a little bit. He struggled with his pride. 
all right? And purification is necessary for all of us, even the mature saints. Psalms 51 and 7 says this, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me talk about hyssop a little bit. Hyssop is a wild shrub of uncertain identity whose twigs were used for sprinkling in ancient Jewish uh, uh, purification rites, all right? Hyssop is a spiritual herb known for its potential to purify the mind and to cleanse the soul, all right? The hyssop shrub is not very, it's not a very smooth plant either if you look it up, all right? It also looks a little prickly as well, but hyssop produces oil. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Let me say that again. I said hyssop produces oil. Your thorn is producing the oil of God within you. Your thorn is producing the anointing of God within you. That's what it's producing for you. All right. So when it says purge me with hyssop, what we're saying is God purify my mind, cleanse my soul, take out anything on the inside of me that you're displeased with, that you're that you don't desire for me to have. Take all of that out of me. All right. So that the oil can be produced. My God. So that's uh, your the thorn is refining and purifying you. Here's another one. Your thorn is driving you into the will of God. Your thorn is driving you into the will of God. You recall the story of Hannah and Penina uh, in the book of 1 Samuel. Hannah, uh, her womb was closed up. She couldn't have any children, all right? And uh, Hannah and Penina were the two wives of a man named Elkanah. And Penina was the one who constantly teased and mocked Hannah about her inability to bear children. Year after year, Penina kept getting pregnant. And year after year, Hannah was still barren. Hannah was still without child. Now we know in, in, in the Bible times that having a child, especially a man child, having a son was very, very, very important during that time. All right, very, very important. Um, and so Hannah could not give her husband a child and Penina pressed her every single day until Hannah got angry all right Hannah was pressed by by Penina every single day and it, she became so distraught that she became depressed she would cry she stopped eating she prayed so hard that she she looked like a drunk she looked like a crazy woman and actually, Eli had mistaken her and thought she was she was drunk because she was that desperate to have a child. All right. She was deeply depressed that she could not give her husband uh, uh, what what uh, what she thought he wanted. Now, Elkanah, he didn't seem very concerned about her not uh, being able to bear children. He even said to her, well, am I not better to you than 10 sons? Like, why, why are you so distraught? Why are you not eating? Why are you crying? Why are you so distressed? But Hannah was that depressed. She was that distressed. All right. But because this thorn, this person, Penina, and I told you before, sometimes your thorn can be a person. Sometimes your thorn can be a personal relationship. Penina was such a thorn to Hannah that it caused that it drove Hannah into the will of God because she changed her prayer around. She stopped praying for just uh, just about having a child and she began to make a vow to the Lord. She began to tell the Lord, yes, she began to make a commitment to God. And she said, God, if you give me this child, I will give him back to you. I will dedicate him back to you. All right. So her prayer changed. Her will changed. It changed from a, a, a selfish motivation because I believe initially she probably just wanted a child just to shut Penina up. You know, sometimes we pray uh, for certain things because we just want to shut our enemies up. All right. We're tired of them talking. We're tired of them uh, uh, mocking and teasing. And, and so sometimes we pray um, on them instead of for them. And sometimes we pray for God to bless us with certain things. Uh, so that we can show our enemies, you know, um, so that we can show, uh, so that we can sort of flaunt on our enemies. And I believe Hannah was probably in that place. Hannah was probably in that place where she just wanted a child just to shut Penina up. But 
her prayer changed. And that's what your thorn is doing for you. It's changing your prayer. It's changing your heart. It's changing your motivations and your intentions. It's changing you in, in, uh, to, to uh, want to desire the will of God for your life. All right. That's what your thorn is doing for you. And that is the purpose of God assigning your particular thorn because he's trying to get you into his will, further into his purpose. I'm hoping this is um, making sense. Here's the last one, and I'm almost finished. Your thorn expedites your spiritual growth and it produces fruit. Your thorn expedites your spiritual growth and produces fruit. All right. I was doing a study of the sycamore fig tree and um, I found something very interesting about the sycamore fig tree. The figs on the sycamore fig, on the sycamore tree grow in abundant clusters and are smaller than those of the common fig tree. It is the present practice of Egyptian and Cypriot growers of the sycamore tree to pierce the premature fruit with a nail or other sharp instrument in order to make the fruit edible. The wounding or the piercing of sycamore figs at an early ripening stage induces a sharp increase in the emanation of a gas called ethyl ethylene, which accelerates the growth and ripening of the fruit exponentially. All right, I know there was a, quite a few big words in there, so let me just break it down for you. What this is basically saying is, is when the fruit is pierced with a sharp instrument, when it's pierced with a nail, when it's pierced with something sharp, it expedites the growth of that fruit. In order for you to experience spiritual growth, you need your thorn because that's what your thorn is doing for you. It's expediting. It's, it's causing your, uh, uh, the, the uh, rapid growth of your spirituality. That's what it's doing. And when you're growing like that, you produce fruit. It causes you to bear more fruit. St. John 15 and 2 says this, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That it may bring forth more fruit. That's what your thorn is doing for you. It's expediting your spiritual growth. All right? Which leads me to my next point. So there was another man in the Bible that had to endure some thorns. In fact, he bore a crown of thorns on his head. These thorns were used to mock his deity and his kingship, but the blood that was produced from it garnered my salvation. This man's name, of course, is Jesus. So we all know what happened in the book of Genesis with the fall of man, right? Adam and Eve sinned against God. They disobeyed his word and his will. And God cursed the ground for their sake. He told Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. All right. He mentions thorns and thistles, which is a picture of what was to come thousands of years later with Jesus taking on the crown of thorns. So in essence, Jesus was taking on the curse for us. That's what those thorns represent. Oh Lord Jesus, I'm getting excited about this. So he took on the curse for us. He took on the thorns so that we could live in triumph. He took on the pain so that we could operate in purpose. He took on the suffering so that we could get our salvation. All right. So that's what those thorns represent. When he placed those crown of thorns on his head, he was taking the curse for us so that we could live in righteousness. All right. Jesus was forced to wear uh, a crown of thorns on his way to the cross, which was a symbol of the curse, literally placed on the head of the sacrificial lamb. All right. Uh, before Jesus hangs on a cross to absorb the wrath of God, the curse literally hangs on his head as thorns and drips from his body as blood soaked sweat. We now live on the other side of the cross where Jesus still wears a crown, but this time it's not a crown of thorns. 
is no longer a symbol of the curse. Jesus is now crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering, having tasted death for everyone who put their trust in him. All right. So he has now exchanged his crown of thorns for a crown of honor. All right. Which brings me to my next point. There's an old song that says no cross, no crown. But I'm going to change the title tonight. I'm going to say no, no thorns, no throne. No thorns, no throne. Thorns are the prerequisite for the throne. Even Jesus couldn't bypass the suffering of the cross, the suffering of the thorns to get to the throne. In order to get to the throne, you need to endure the suffering of your thorns. Romans 8 and 18 says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Second Timothy 2 and 12 says this, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. But the rain doesn't come until you suffer. The rain can't come until you suffer. All right. But listen to this. Second Corinthians 4 and 17 says this for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I want you to consider that verse for a minute for our light affliction, our light affliction. Now, sometimes the afflictions and the troubles and issues that we go through, they don't feel light. They feel heavy. They feel burdensome. OK, but the reason why the Bible can call it a light affliction is because we're not in it alone. We've got some help. We've got a helper called the Holy Ghost who is there to help uh, bear us, uh, bear our infirmities. All right, because that's what the Holy Ghost does. It helpeth our weaknesses and it makes intercession for us with groanings. All right. So that's what allows your affliction to become light It's because you've got some help. You've got some assistance to help you bear that thing, all right? And considering what Jesus has gone through, considering what Jesus has suffered with, your affliction is just a light thing. Considering what he had to endure, that affliction that you've got, oh, it's just a light thing. It's just a light thing. And not only is it light, but it's but for a moment. It's momentary. It's temporary. It's not going to last long. It'll be here and then it'll be gone. All right. It will not last long. There's an old song that says trouble don't last always. And it's true. This issue, this thorn that you've got, it's not going to be here forever. All right. So your thorn, your light affliction, it's light and it's only here for a moment. But it worketh for us. It worketh for us a far more exceeding, exceeding. Uh, that can also mean heavy, exceeding. An, an eternal weight of glory. See the contrast between there? Your affliction is light and your affliction is but for a moment. But the glory that's going to be produced as a result of your, of your thorn is going to do far more exceeding and, and have an, an eternal weight of glory. This weight of glory is not going to leave. It's going to be eternal. It's going to be here forever. All right. And it's going to reverberate throughout generations. All right. So this affliction, it's light and it's temporal, but it's working something that is eternal. It's working something eternal for me. That's the end of my lesson tonight. I hope you were blessed by it. I hope you received something from it. <sighs> Thorny gifts. Thorny gifts. So the thing I want you to leave with tonight is just for you to be encouraged. Just be encouraged. Um, we all have to endure our thorns. We all have to go through. We all have to suffer. We can't bypass it. I wish there was a way to bypass it. Even Jesus wanted to bypass it. He said, nevertheless, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, thy will be done. All right. He prayed about it multiple times when it got to remove this cup from him, all right? But he knew he had to go through it. He knew he had to endure it because he knew it was going to be a blessing to us. 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, that joy that was set before him, that was us. That was us. He saw us living in victory. He saw us uh, living a victorious life and endured the cross, went through the process. It was uncomfortable. It was hard. It was painful, but he endured it. All right. And so in the same way, we have to endure our thorns, our cups that God has assigned to us because he knows how he made us. He knows how he designed us. We were designed for this thorn. We were designed to endure through it. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to take you out. It's only going to make you stronger and cause the glory and the power of God to flow through you. God bless uh, each and every one of you. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Um, if you don't have anything to do tonight at 8 o'clock, we are on the prayer line. The number is 1720-650-3030, and the PIN code is 315-2114-POUND. Join us on the prayer line tonight at 8 p.m. God bless you all.